All right. I know these classes tend to run long, so we'll go ahead and get started and get as much time as we can get. So welcome everyone to the um, second and final class in this series on nature journaling. Um, I'm happy to have Jack rejoin me for this class and also his um, nature journaling friend, Fiona. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves a little better, but Fiona is um, an avid nature journaler who is a great member of this um, nature journaling community. And she's written an article for Birders Magazine. So um, we thought it would be a great thing as Jack went more into sort of some pro tips on na nature journaling to have a member of the community in here and get a little bit more of that community feeling. So with that, I'll let um, Jack and Fiona take it away. Thank you so much, Hamar. Um, Fiona and I are really delighted to be here with all of you today. And I am, uh, let's see, our, actually just sort of a, a technical check here. Um, are we spotlighted? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Then <laughs> what I see on my screen is different than what you guys see. Um, but uh, I, I'm really delighted to be here with Fiona. Um, and Fiona and I are sort of nature journaling buddies. And uh, she is someone who has, um, when, when she, I, actually, what I'll do is I'll, I'll let Fiona introduce um, herself, but I, I think that you're going to find that uh, she is a really insightful, and, uh, and sort of nature journaling visionary. She has taken for me the idea of asking questions and what you can do with your curiosity to a higher level than, um, I, uh, than, 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 I, than I would have gone just playing around on my own. And she has helped me kind of develop my game. And it's really useful to take a look at the journals of different people if you just look at one person's journal, then you think that, oh, that person, the way that they're doing it is the way you're supposed to be doing it. But there's a lot of, lots of ways of, of keeping journals. Um, and so part of what we're gonna be doing is looking at pages from both of our journals. And we also are going to be taking a look at kind of what you can do when your curiosity gets sparked and excited. Um, Fiona. Do you want, would you uh, introduce yourself to this group? Um, hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Fiona Gologli. I'm 17 years old. I've been journaling for almost five years now. Um, and I've been a birder since I was 15, maybe? 11. No, 11, 11. Never mind. I've been journaling <laughs> since I was 13 and a birder since I was 11. Um, and yeah, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, I met Jack when I was 13 um, and started journaling then, and I've been journaling ever since. Um, and it's really super fun, and I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. <clears throat> this, this is going to be a real hoot. I think that um, something that, that has been really fun for me is watching your development as a, as a journaler, as a birder, as, as, a, as, a, as a naturalist. And as you have done that, as folks will, will see, you have innovated a number of really interesting strategies for getting your experience with birds down on paper. Um, and something that I think comes across from looking at your pages as well is just sort of the, the joy and excitement of looking at these little feathered balls and uh, the... Uh, I think of the, the journal page as just another way of celebrating that and encountering it. Let's start though, by just taking a look at some of the, 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 the pages that people have put together um, from our last class. So if you were here before, um, I'm going to share a screen here. If I can push the right buttons. There we go. So let's take a look at this. This is um, 
notes and, uh, and, and, and pages that people sent in to Audubon on the heels of our last class. And it's really exciting to, to see this kind of work. I think that the, we're, we're seeing on these pages, words and pictures, um, the, the, this approach of taking your birding observations and putting them down on paper is going to help you connect with birds in a profoundly different way. And I just want to encourage everybody in this, uh, on this call to give yourself permission to start. Wherever you start, you're gonna be starting at different levels. And there is, especially for adults, something that adults tend to not want to do is to do anything, to start anything that they're not already really good at. Because adults often, we identify ourselves by our competencies, things that I'm really, really good at. So if I'm, if I'm in a beginner place with something, that's a scary place to be. Um, but this is, this is a skill set that you can develop and learn. And the best way to do that is just by diving in. And um, you, Fiona, have um, absolutely jumped into this. Uh, you, you jumped into the deep end. Um, this is, uh, do you want to tell people about this stack? Yeah, this is me and all the journals I've filled um, in the last um, four years, um, almost five now. Um, but yeah, this is me on top of all my <laughs> stack of journals. I think I have like two more since I took this picture. And, uh, and these pages are, and these books, books are dense. Um, when you started this, um, well, what sort, what sort of changes have you seen in your sort of journaling? What would you say are some of the more significant journaling changes that you've seen in your practice from your first notebooks to now? I started out thinking of it as art. Um, and now I think of it as like just having fun in nature. And it's very, very different. Um, I started out thinking that this is my art kit and I'm taking it into nature. Um, and now it's more, I'm in nature with my art kit. Um, and so I've definitely shifted a lot in thinking about the pretty pictures. Um, I used to kind of get scared about the pretty pictures and now I'm not as much anymore. I also ask more questions now, um, which is really fun. Um, I used to not really write that much on my page and now I have writing everywhere and it's crazy. Um, but yeah, so I've asked way more questions. Um, I've gotten better at getting the bird really fast, like just like quick little sketches of the bird as it's moving. Um, I used to think I only needed to do one of each species. Now I can, I feel more free to draw multiple different um, angles of the same bird. Um, so it's definitely changed a lot um, and it's gone more towards notes and less towards art. More towards notes and less towards art. So those, those notes, that, that those notes when you're thinking about it as notes, that's really a direct encounter with whatever phenomenon that you're seeing. It's about, the notes are about the bird, right? Sometimes when we think about it as art, it becomes about the art instead of the bird. Right. And so this, that, 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 that framing I think is really helpful to, to help us be able to, to do this. Let's, um, we, we did a, a, early on when you were sort of focused on the art or more focused on art, um, you did a school project to, to do, to draw a whole bunch of birds. Yes, um, and you were my mentor on that project. 
Um, and that was really, really fun. Um, in my eighth grade year, the school that I go to, they require you to do like a project um, at the end of your eighth grade year. So I decided I want to do like bird illustrations. So I decided I was going to draw the 40 most common birds um, from my area. And so Jack suggested that I draw an American Robin at the beginning of my uh, of, of this time and then at the end of the time after I had been drawing. So here's the first one on the left and then the second one on the right um, of this Robin that I drew from the same photo. Um, and I was a completely different person at the end of this, um, at the end of this time than I was at the beginning of it. So, and be between these two pictures, there were a lot of bird drawings that went, went by. Yes. Lots and lots and lots of drawings. So from, from that stack, um, and also from, from this, you can see that you've put in a ton of pencil miles. So part of what happens when you do that is that at the start, our, our brains can get really wrapped around the mechanics of how do I do, how do I, how do I do something? The more that you drill something in your head and the more that you rehearse it, the more that you explore something, the more our brains change in response to that work. And so the, the idea of like, oh, how would I even start on that? Those, those, the stress about art starts to kind of get out of the way and lets that direct experience with the bird in. Um, how, how would you compare your experience when you are, if, if you were journalists, versus the, the journal. How does it fundamentally change your, your sense of, uh, your, your experience when you're, you're out there sans journal? Um, something that I've really noticed um, is that I stay with things longer when I have my journal. I watch okay. birds longer um, and because I'm drawing them, because I'm sitting with them and drawing them and staying long enough to be able to draw them as opposed to when I don't have my journal, I just look at them with my binoculars. And I'm like, oh, cool. And I move on. Um, so it helps me stay longer when I have my journal, um, which is really nice. You know, there is, there's so much in our, our world culture society right now that is getting us to just shift and change gears. Go, 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 go to the next thing, go to the next thing, go to the next thing. We have online environments that are designed to get us to click to the next thing, click to the next thing, click to the next thing. Even before you're finished with whatever you were originally there to do, you're being, we are in a distraction rich environment. And I think of the, the, this sort of journaling as kind of an antidote to that. Because it, I, I've had the same experience. If I'm journaling, I go slower and I see more because I'm taking that kind of time. Mm -hmm. um, and the more that you do that, I think that that trains our brains. Like if, if you get used to just, you know, swipe to the next, swipe to the next, swipe to the next, then um, your brain is going to work in a really different way than if you're training it to, to stop, to sink in, to go deeper. I've put together a number of our journal pages and I've put them in some categories of, to, to kind of prompt us to play with different ideas here. And here is our, <clears throat> here is some of the, let me see if I can, Get rid of this little high floating meeting controls. There we go. So I thought we would kind of categories would be fun to, to explore is what happens with sort of the idea of doing investigations in journals. And um, originally that one was lower down on my list because I knew that like a lot of people, when they come to birding, they start with identification. So that one was on the top of my list. But then I realized that for the two of us, this kind of curiosity and investigation is such a kind of core part of what we're looking at. Um, I thought we'd introduce that up at the start and then kind of back down so sort of lower on thinking and learning kind of we can revisit it a little bit. But 
to take a look at the, the role of, of curiosity in our journals and, and how we kind of intentionally do curiosity, because that's a, that's a real game changer. You talked about kind of now you're writing all these sorts of questions and things. And somebody who first hears that might think to yourself like, but you know, you should have fewer questions because you're now a better birder and stuff like that. But I think we're gonna kind of unpack why that's not at all the experience of that, 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 that what happens here or the goal. Then kind of look at journaling as a tool for helping us with identification of things, looking at behaviors, connecting with a place and, and other um, sorts of connections that we can pull into our journals. So let's maybe jump over to this, just we're gonna just uh, roll down this list here. And when I look at this page, the, one of the things that jumps out to me is a whole mess of, not uh, maybe the, uh, meaning a whole lot of, but not a mess of, um, a whole lot of question marks. Can you unpack what is going on on this page and more specifically in your brain when you are playing on a page like this? Yes, um, so this was a um, leucistic California scrub jay that I saw in my yard um, that I nicknamed Lucy. Um, and she was this regular scrub jay that kept coming to the suet feeder. Um, and I was just, blown away. I, I had never really seen leucistic birds before. Um, so I was wondering, like, is this inherited? Like, how does this work? Um, and I was, I was super excited about this. So I was asking all these sorts of questions. So each of those little blue little squiggles is a little question mark and next to it is a question and they're linked together with arrows. So there are kind of these question chains that I started writing. I was just fascinated with this bird. And um, also in terms of like recognizing individuals, I could recognize this individual scrub jay and she would come back to our suet feeder um, and did for a couple weeks. Um, and basically, so I, I'm, I didn't really know that much about leucism and how it works. Um, and apparently it affects it, it basically takes away carotenoid pigments, but blue is a structural color, which is a really cool. So that took me a while to realize because I was like, oh, this is a leucistic bird, um, meaning that it's lost some of the pigment in its feathers. But then I was like, but wait, blue is a structural color, which means the actual structure of the feather refracts blue light. So if you take a blue feather and you hold it up to the sun, it looks black, which is fascinating. And so then I was like, well, then it must not be a pigment deficiency. It must be an actual structural deficiency so that the structure of the feather is wrong, meaning that it can't refract the blue light. So oh. my was blowing up. So I was, I drew this little diagram um, up in the, in the upper part of this page um, about how blue feathers work and trying to figure that out. So I'm not even sure if it's leucism. I don't know what it is. I just came off of a genetics class um, in school. And so now I was kind of thinking about it in terms, I, I was just looking back at this page a few days ago and I was like, well, maybe it's like some involving like multiple genes. So now I was thinking about it with like my genetics brain, which was really fun. Um, and oh, wow. That's day. next level. So anyway, I'm not even sure what's going on, but I had a ton of questions about this bird. So all of these, um, are all, are all questions about this particular scrub jay. Um, and it's white feathers. So that was really, really fun. So this is, so, so what, what we're seeing here is this is what Fiona's doing a full brain download onto the piece of paper. So there's the, the, the bird, the phenomenon that's in front of her. And what you're seeing here is all of her thinking and, um, and, and, and questions and possible answers to that. If you get yourself curious about anything that you're looking at, your, the intensity of the way that you look totally changes and your experience totally changes. Um, think, like I want everybody who's listening to this call sort of in your body sort of imagine the feeling of being curious about something, you know, that kind of how you kind of lean in to something. And, right, so Lucy here, Fiona's brain is hooked on Lucy, 
right? And for a lot of us, like you'd be like, oh, cool. There's 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 a there's 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 a, a bird with some. I mean, a, a, a there's a, there's a scrub jay and it's got some white in its feathers, or maybe it's leucistic. And and then our brain would kind of go like, okay, cool. And then if you had read a text about um, you know pigments in birds, your brain would go like, okay, that's a leucistic leucistic scrub jay, and isn't that cool? And your brain would go on to the next thing. But because she's putting all those thoughts and questions down on paper, she's sticking with this longer and her brain is going to the next level. Like, did you get that next level? So she's noticing like this leucistic stuff that's supposed to be a pigment phenomenon. And the blue is not a pigment color in Jace. Like, so for everybody who hasn't, um, if you haven't sort of checked this out yet, what, what she was saying about like, yeah, that the, the blue in the feather, that is not a pigment. If you take a blue feather and you grind it into a powder, you get a gray powder. And it's because of little micro structures reflecting back only the blue light that you get that. But how we normally think about these birds with like these big white spots, that's all, that's, that's a pigment thing, not a structural thing. So she has, she stuck with this long enough and the mystery that is behind the mystery came out. And that, that, that doesn't happen to us if we're just sort of sitting there and kind of like, boop, 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 boop. oh, look, that's pretty cool, right? The way we, the, the, nor, the default mode that we have for paying attention doesn't take our brain here. But this sort of thing is possible if we're slowed down by our journal. I think that this is, this is so ridiculously cool. The, uh, and I also love the little cartoon off in the corner that is you sort of making this discovery here. You know, that, that sort of personal part of the story, um, when you connect with that too, that whole experience just sticks with you so much better. So I'm seeing that you're, um, so for that little diagram with the blue feathers, did that, was that already in your head? Did you go look at other reference material to pull that up? Is that, how did, how did that come about? Um, I wanted to see what, so I knew that blue was a structural color. I had heard that, but I had never seen a diagram of how it worked. So I went and looked up diagram for blue structural color um, to help me understand where the genetic problem might be, um, whether it was in the melanin layer or I, I, I didn't know how that all worked. Yeah. So I wanted to be able to see it. So that was, I, I looked it up um, and copied that diagram into my journal and then asked some more questions about how this diagram worked and stuff like that. Very cool. So so also what, what's going on here is that this chain of curiosity then prompted me like, you know how often we say like, oh yeah, I should look that up. I should, she actually did look it up. And not only that, looked it up and then made a diagram of it that then like, if you look something up in a book, you kind of like, oh, I've got my answer, right? But then you go ahead and forget it. But that's not what happens if you then copy that diagram into your notes. So this is, Think about what could be going on in your brain. Think about what is going on in the brain here. That, this is, that's really cool. Um, this is a um, sort of also kind of talking about kind of questions. Um, something that, that Fiona is helping push me towards is writing more questions in my own journal. Because I, I have the same experience. When I get really curious about something, my, uh, my kind of lean into that becomes much, um, much richer. And um, so here are some, some field notes that I have um, about watching little buffle heads, right? And um, I, was, uh, I was watching them, watching their behaviors of their, their, their bodies. I was timing how long they were, how many seconds they were underwater and kind of making a graph of that. Um, but the, something that I'm starting to take from, from your, your pages that I really love are your, your, your curiosity change, those little question chains that you do. 
where you've got one thought or idea and that stimulates you to ask this, that then stimulates you to ask this and stimulates you to ask this. And you don't even have to get this one answered to get the one that's behind it. Um, so I just wanted to point this out to you that, that this, um, what you're seeing on this page is that sort of the starts of my moving progressively towards that. I'm not, I don't have your, uh, the, my, the system down as smoothly as, as you do yet, but you're my role model for how to be curious on paper. Um, so I'm, so I'm noticing that a number of these birds will, they'll dive at the same time. And, um, and I'm then wondering is, is that, you know, could that be, is there some advantage of, of doing that? And does the, does, does synchronizing your behavior like that make us, make the, the flock more cohesive? And, or does it work the other way around? Does the, a, a more cohesive flock then cause our synchroniz synchronization to going. I started thinking about mirror neurons and these sorts of things in human brains. And I realized that you would have written that down. You would have kind of, you would have, you would have followed that, that out. And I think that that, that is, that's where I want to, I think that's, that's going to be like, for me, like the next evolution in my nature journaling is to start to intentionally follow out some of those, um, those, those, those question chains. Um, here's another example of uh, an adventure that you had. Could you unpack this for us a little bit? Uh, yes, this was a short-eared owl. Um, that was the first time I'd ever seen a short-eared owl and I was really excited. I had heard about it from a friend that there was this specific road um, that where, where there were short-eared owls that he saw right at sunset. And so I drove out there with, with my family um, and we waited um, there till sunset. And then here come the short-eared owls over the meadow. And it was so incredibly cool. Um, so this was a little landscape of kind of how, how the general place looked and then a little arrow where the short-eared owl was. Um, I drew it from multiple angles. Um, I made a little note um, that the first short-eared owl was seen at 4.59. Um, so I was making, since time, time really mattered. So I decided I was gonna write um, when I saw the first short-eared owl. Um, and they stayed around and called and hunted in the meadow for a while. Um, and it was really, really cool. There were some great horned owls that were calling in the trees. Um, so I was, I was super excited um, to see this bird, um, it makes a sound almost like a cat. It kind of has this kind of sound. It, it sounds like a meow of a cat almost, um, which was really interesting. Um, I was watching the way that they fly um, and how flat their faces are when they fly. It's very strange. I'm used mm. to seeing like raptor heads with like beaks and their faces are just completely flat, which is very strange to try and draw. Um, so that, that was really fun, um, but yeah. That's, that's cool. Call like a, 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 a cat. So now when you write, when we write this stuff down, when we draw pictures of this stuff, however, we're getting into our journals, that little bit of attention helps our brains remember these experiences so much more vividly. So what you're also seeing here, folks, is a major um, brain hack to get details into your head. Like if you ever learned how the, a short-eared owl or heard a short-eared owl and then forgotten how a short-eared owl sounds, right? The a solution to that is to start to put it down in a notebook like this. So um, you do, put it down your descriptions. That's a great, what we call, uh, and, and it reminds me of. So you can either have a, a description of the sound that goes wee to wee to zee zee zee, um, or a, it reminds me of a cat. Um, these, those sorts of things, just the act of writing that down in your notebook is going to help your brain hold on to it. And also, if you then do forget, you have those written notes that you can go back to and, and, and pull up. And um, when you look at this page, um, do you find, I, I find that for, for me, I'd be curious if it's the same for you, that when you look like at a page like this, all these associated other experiences that didn't even get put down on the page also come flooding back 
because yeah. you're there. In order to do this kind of journaling, you have to, your brain has to be on fully paying attention. And so there are all these other little memories that kind of come in as sort of a sidecars on this. You can remember who you were there with, what the weather felt like. Oh, it's even written down there, it was cold. Um, the, uh, all those sorts of details um, come flooding back in. Yes, um, I remember it was very cold. Um, I remember standing, it was kind of in this tall grass. There were other birders there. Um, we were all watching these short-eared owls. Um, yeah, definitely there are a lot of memories um, from this page and I found that's really true with journaling that when I draw and journal, I can go back and look at that page and be like, oh yeah. Um, and it's, it's so fun to go back. <laughs> yeah. So here's a kind of a, another little kind of curiosity um, exploration from, from my journals. Um, this was where I, um, it, I found a, a painted bunting and I noticed that the painted bunting was variable. So I know there's a variable bunting. So this is the variable painted bunting. Um, and what I discovered is that um, as I looked at the painted bunting from different angles, and this ties into your J thing, how it's a, the, the, the light reflecting off the, um, those colors on the bird that changes, um, there, there are, there's, there's pigment colors and there's structural colors and the blues and the greens are structural colors. Um, so this was a bird with structural colors and pigment colors on it. And so it has blue head, green back, structural, and then red belly, pigment. And what I did is I circumnavigated the bird. So as the, uh, this, in my little diagram here, I have um, the bird drawn from several different angles. And this is how the bird looks when I'm when the sun is behind me, how the bird looks when the sun is at my side and how the bird looks with, uh, when I'm looking into the sun. And what I noticed was that the, the red really showed through a lot better. Uh, about that, everybody? Um, the, uh, the red shows through. And the um, the blues and the greens were not as prominent. And then that made me um, think that, so the question that comes from that observation, are the birds with the structural colors, are they more deliberate about displaying to, are males more deliberate about displaying to females, making sure that they've got the light angle right? And something like a kiskadee doesn't have to to worry about that as much because it's all like, you know, hey, if you've got, pigment colors, you don't have to be. So that um, this set of observations then kind of cascaded me into these other questions. And then I was tr looking around for, can I find examples of birds? Uh, you know, when I was then looking for kiskadees, which there are a number in this area, and I was trying to see when they display, are they, do they tend to be on any angle to a female? And or, um, and would the, the painted buntings be more deliberate about making sure that the sunlight is on them so that they're looking towards the sun, towards the female, so the females be able to look at them. I ended up not being able to answer that that day because um, I didn't find, uh, I couldn't find places where a bird was, you know, here's the female bird, here's the male bird and um, with them singing. But, but because I diagrammed it down here, that, that question then sticks in my head. And anytime I'm out in the field and I try to find, find another phenomenon that kind of relates to that, I go like, ooh, 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 this might be, this might be a chance to sort of get some answers on that. Another thing that we can do with our journals is if you find that you go out and you are seeing a bird and, um, you, you know, somebody says like, oh yeah, that's a kiskadee. And you go like, oh cool, kiskadee. And then you come back at the end of the hike and you're like, I, I've forgotten it all, right? It's hard to remember, like how do you learn these birds? Um, 
journaling is actually your answer. And it doesn't matter if you get a picture that's a pretty picture or not. Um, if, you, uh, if you journal about it, your memory of that is gonna be so much better. And the other thing that's cool is that the process of, of making a diagram or a picture of that bird it's going to force you to look at that bird so much more carefully than you otherwise would. That, um, that, so that act of attention and the act of writing it down, that's what is going to be the glue that is going to stick these things into your head. So here's another one of your journal pages, and you're doing a number of strategies on here that I think really kind of help us with um, identification. Yeah, so this this was actually, I was looking at this little sparrow and I had no idea what it was. Um, and I didn't have a bird book with me. So I decided I was gonna draw it um, and then take really careful notes on the facial patterns and then go back and look it up later. Um, I believe it was a Lincoln sparrow, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, I, didn't, I didn't know what this was but I drew it anyway and it was still really fun and I still ask questions about it. Um, and yeah, this was also looking at greater and lesser sandhill cranes and the difference between them, that the graders are often larger and the lessers are often smaller, um, and zooming in on the sandhill crane face um, and being able to see through their nose. It's kind of cool, their, um, their beak, because of the way their beak is structured, you can see through their nose, um, which is really fun. Um, and yeah, some tundra swans, this was really, really fun. Um, and can I also point out, everybody check this out. Notice that her questions and comments about the, the swan have white question marks. The ones about the mystery sparrow have brown ones and gray over there for the sandhill cranes. That is some next level metacognition going on right there. That's very, very cool. Um, so yeah, so you're, you're, you're journaling this to learn about it. And in order to do that, you have to look back and back and back at these things with such intensity. Um, in, if you just look at something and think to yourself, you'll remember that, our brain doesn't have the bandwidth for that. Right? But you put it down on paper, this then becomes an extension of your brain. Um, I, I like here also just for identification purposes, just seeing the um, proportion differences with the greater and lesser sand hills, seeing those together. And that strategy that you're using here also of um, zooming in on the face or zooming out and getting the general shape of the thing, you see that in the swans and the sand hill. Um, that is a strategy that I wanna encourage everybody on the call to remember and to start to use. So you can change the scale and the proportions of things that you're putting down on the page. These are some field notes of a, uh, a really bizarre looking little bird um, that I saw in Rwanda. And what I like doing, um, what I was doing here is I was going um, birding without my bird book. And I don't know uh, all the birds of Rwanda. There are a lot of them. And, um, but I find that sometimes when I go without the bird book, it forces me to make really intense, careful observations that I otherwise wouldn't make. Um, very much like you're doing with that mystery sparrow. So I'm putting myself into the mystery sparrow position intentionally. Because sometimes if I, I, I find that, you know, even though I, I, I know that this happens to people, I know that sometimes when we get the identification of something, we stop looking at it as carefully. I, I know that that's true, but still sometimes I'm guilty of, of doing that. I'll go like, oh, it's a that. And then I go like, yep, it sure is a that. And then whoop, I'm on to the next thing. But if I can't do that, then it's going to make me stick around and, and look in, again and again and again. And something that I, um, want to give everybody permission to do is when you're taking notes like these, mistakes are going to happen. And 
that's okay. And what you want to do is be willing to have mistakes happen in your field notes. Because um, what I used to think that your, your drawings were supposed to be field guide perfect. And so what I would do is I would draw something, not commit it to ink, because then I would go back and I'd check in the field guides and go like, oh, it should look like this and it should look like this. And then I would change my drawing to look like the one in the field guide. And then what I'm doing is I'm deleting my sort of primary sense experience that I had. Now I know that my eyes play tricks on me and I know that sometimes I see things wrong and you can actually see this on this page and I'll show you a few other examples of this. So be willing to make mistakes on paper. Your drawings don't have to be perfect. So on my first little picture of what turned out to be the spot flanked barbet, um, I saw that it had a big white wing bar. And so mine has one big white wing bar on it. Cool. Um, so then I get other looks at it and that wing bar is actually the edge of the scapulars and it has a yellow wing bar. And that was the edge of the scapula. So my brain saw something, but my brain's overwhelmed. I can't hold all this information in here at once. And I try to get it down. You're just gonna do the best that you can. And you have permission to make mistakes. Here's another example of this. Um, I was in Mexico and this crazy long tailed magpie jay pops up on a bush in front of me. I didn't have a field guide. I actually went birding uh, the, the entire trip. I had no field guides with me. Intentionally, I brought no field guides because I wanted to see like, what, what can I do to kind of leverage my brain to look and 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 not try to take this shortcut of going like, oh, how should it look? Oh yeah, that's what I'm seeing. But so watch what happens with the transformations in this bird as I drew sketches over it over several days. So the first time I see it, it's got a solid black head. And then the next time I get a look at this bird, I go like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, it, it actually has a little white whisker. That's cool. Um, also, as it was landing, I saw that it had cool black and white patterns in its tail. And so I made this initial sketch of that right here. So take a look at that. This is, this is what you're seeing in the tail here is black tail with black edges with white inside. And then I got a better look at it and realized that no, the white is on the outside edges of this. And so it's not, this pattern at all. So this was a mistake that I made and that's okay. I want, I'm just that I noticed that there are black and white patterns in the tail. That's great. <clears throat> and, but I can iteratively, because I put my marks down on paper, I'm saying, this is what I think I saw. I'm then able to look at that and go like, is that really what I saw? And then be able to change that over time. Here, my next drawing of it, look at all these cool white patterns around the face now. So by the time I left, I had a much better understanding of this bird. But notice that there's all those, there were mistakes in my perception. Um, so my brain is filtering all sorts of information before it gets to my conscious mind. And then my memory comes in and will take those altered perceptions that are also very often, you will see what you expect to see, right? So if I'm expecting it to be a solid white head, I'm more like, I mean, solid black head, I'm more likely to see a solid black head. But, um, if I am willing to look again and look again and look again, I can constantly be updating my understanding of whatever it is that I'm seeing step by step. Here is, we're sort of thinking about um, identifying things. So here are um, the, the, I've got a turn and a puffin here. 
um, birds with bold black and white patterns um, from the perspective of kind of learning these. This was in an environment where these were, there's a bunch of new birds for you. Yes. And um, you used the, the sketching here to wrap your head around, oh, I love the way you handled that bird's wing in flight there, that puff and flying. Because when they're doing this with their wing, yeah, <laughs> you, you can't see that. It's just a gray blur there. And that's what you've got. You're yeah. drawing what you see. Yeah. Um, so can you unpack this for us? Yeah, this was a really fun page. I, I got to sit in a bird blind um, on a seabird research um, island in Maine. I got to sit in a bird blind for an hour and watch puffin burrows. Um, so that was super, super fun um, to like sit in the bird blind and the puffins were right there. So I got oh. super confused through my binoculars, which was really, really fun. Um, and yeah, I, and then also just watching them fly by with fish. They would just zoom by across my, my vision with their little wings going like this. Um, and they have like such short stubby wings. All the alcids have like tiny little wings and they're just really, really funny. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of fun um, with this um, and watching some turns um, and watching how they land, which was really fun. Um, a guillemot nest um, and then just really close up views from that bird blind of the puffin and the common turn as well. Oh, that's really cool. Um, you're having fun with this. Um, chur, 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 cuck, 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 cuck. Get off my roof. Um, you're being playful with this. Um, and, you know, just kind of un un unpacking like what is kind of going on in your brain here. So you're zooming in and zooming out, right? You're looking at things at different scales. You're doing sequential things and we'll get more to some examples of that. Um, you've got things with, with habitat down there that the Guillemot nest. Mm -hmm. We've got questions, observations, um, and I'm also seeing these little boxes with um, the, the location, the date on all your pages. Yes. Um, so I call those weather boxes. Um, so that's basically all of my metadata. So I have the, the date, um, the, I, I've, I've actually refined this much more than, than I do here. Now I have little letter codes and little codes. I have like a whole list of weather codes that I use now. Oh. Um, but at the time I was just writing um, whether it was warm, whether it was cool. Um, now I have it completely different now. And this day is perfect. I would, exactly. I, I would draw, um, like if, if the sun was out, I'd draw a little sun. If there was clouds and the sun, I'd draw a little cloud. Um, so I kind of draw what the sky looks like, um, what the weather is like, and then also where I am. Um, and if the time is relevant, I'll put the time in as well. So that, that's, that's really uh, kind of thinking like a scientist. Thinking like a scientist, kind of get so every one of your pages is then date stamped and geo referenced. The um, so think about you know, how different this your brain interacts with this than you would if you came to a page and there was a drawing of the puffin in the middle of the page, and then you turn the next page and there's a drawing of a guillemot in the middle of the page. Right here, you're changing sizes, angles, views, behaviors. This is really dynamic. And also again, notice all those color coded, coded questions and comments about all the things going on with that. Love it. Um, <clears throat> this is me geeking out again, trying to learn unfamiliar birds. I'm now in um, by a lake in Rwanda with and, and, and running around intentionally not um, to kind of going from a bird book, but from direct observations. And a strategy that uh, we often use uh, when we're doing something like this is to, you'll notice that there's on this, this, this one bird, there's a bunch of different angles. The reason is because birds move. Um, so if the bird moves, I do a new view. If the bird moves again, I do a new view. And not all the views get finished, but the positions that the bird comes back to the, the most often or stays in the longest, I'll get further along on those. And so the, the, the parts of drawings that you get the, 
the most done on are gonna be the sort of the most characteristic postures of that bird. Um, so you'll see in Fiona's notes and also in my notes, we are very often not just, we're not thinking of this as a portrait. If you're partway through and the bird moves, we just sort of, we flow on to the next one. Um, and it gives you a page with just a much more, um, it's more fun to, for other, for, for you to, to, to look at this. It's more fun for me to look at it. And the reason is because there's just a higher density of information all on that page. Um, here again, you're seeing these multiple views. And is there anything that you wanted to uh, unpack about this? Yeah, this was actually a super cool um, day at the beach that I spent. Um, and there were these beautiful cliffs up behind me and there was a peregrine falcon that flew in with what I think was a blackbird, I'm not exactly sure, um, and started shredding it while sitting on the cliffs and I got to watch it eat this blackbird. Um, and so there were like feathers floating through the air. It was a super windy day. So like the feathers were being blown all over. It was crazy. Um, and so, yeah, that was really super cool. And just drawing it from all these different angles. And I just got to sit under it on uh, like under this cliff and just watch it, um, which was really super cool. Um, and then also there were some snowy plovers on the beach, which were super cute. It was kind of funny. There was a flock of snowy plovers and one sanderling in with them. Um, which was kind of funny. Um, and yeah, this 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 was a really fun day. And also the color-coded question marks, um, all the orange ones are the Caspian Tern, the white ones are the Snowy Plovers, and the gray ones are the Peregrine Falcons. Nice. And when people look at this, they would assume, uh, very often people assume, because we think of like making a drawing and finishing that drawing, that you did one of these drawings and then you finished it, and you moved to the next one, you did that, you moved to the next one, you did that. But um, am I, Correct that on um, as you're doing these, you are also bouncing around kind of multiple drawings all kind of working at the same time. And then um, the that's that's a much more kind of useful flow for the field than do one drawing, do another drawing, do another drawing. Yeah, I was I was especially working on there's kind of three in a triangle in the middle where it was eating. Um, and it would go down and it would eat, 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 and then it would kind of lift up and look around and look around and then keep eating, 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 and then pick its head up and look around. So I was going back and forth and back and forth between those two. Um, well, yeah. drawing it as it was tipping its head up, up and down. Yeah, I, I've had that experience. Like if, if the bird, if I'm, if I'm drawing the bird doing this, and then the bird starts eating down here. If I go like, like I gotta see this thing of this angle here and I just start waiting for the bird to come back to this position, for some reason they never do, right? So then what you do is you start this drawing down here, the bird's down here, nibble, 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 right? And, and then you can start working on that and then it'll do this, right? So you can do that view, Right, so you get multiple drawings and then eventually the bird's gonna run out of possibilities. You don't have to finish any of these drawings, but that's, that's a very kind of effective flow for the field. Um, this is an example of what we call a comparison. If you do have, if nature ever presents to you opportunities to look at um, similar species at the same time, the characteristics of one will really help you notice um, the, uh, the, 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 the features of the other. So if you have an opportunity to draw a couple of, um, of different gulls at the same time, studying one gull will be okay. But if you're simultaneously looking at two different species of gulls, the features of one help you notice what is significant about the other. Um, here's another little comparison that I did of juncos in New Mexico. And um, the dark-eyed juncos are not looking the way that I'm, I'm, I'm in Oregon junco land, right? So anything that's not an Oregon dark-eyed junco, I'm like, what on earth is that thing? And so over there, they, it was just, it was this, this junko smorgasbord. Um, and so what you, you see me doing 
is by doing them as a comparison, they're all kind of out hanging out in the same flock. Um, I'm able to, um, looking at the features of one really helps me kind of dial in on how the other one is different. Another thing that we both love to do is to look at bird behavior, right? And, and this, is, this is, is so cool. Um, we've talked about this a little bit, like this just, this change in, this is a, a, a solitaire in the middle of winter, it's cold, it lands, and I start to draw it. And after a while, it's kind of settled into that position. And its feathers on its wing have fluffed up, on its belly have fluffed up over its wing, kind of pulling its warm coat over it. The, on, on one level, you'd say like, oh no, it's changed its position. On the other hand, this little subtle thing is a really cool example of an animal behavior. So you can see an animal behaviors between individuals or just on one critter. And birds are always doing something. So the bird that's sitting on the bush doing nothing is sitting on the bush, right? And so what you wanna do is train yourself, can you see the something that is always going on? Can you find the something in the nothing? So this, that the bird is sitting there and then it sinks down and fluffs. That, that's significant because it's cold. Um, there are other, here's some, some, some other uh, examples of kind of exploring behavior. Yeah, this was um, a great horned owl. My, my, my mom and I were driving in the car and it was kind of dusk and my mom was like, oh, look, there's a bird on the telephone wire. So I leaned out the window um, and I was like, oh my gosh, it's a great horned owl, mom, can we pull over? And my mom being the awesome mom that she is, um, she did pull over for me. Um, and so we got out of the car and we started drawing um, and the owl started doing this like weird yawning thing. And I was wondering what it was doing and it was like stretching its neck and I wasn't really sure. And then it coughed up a pellet. Um, In front of you. Was crazy to see. I had never seen an owl do this before. And me being the crazy naturalist that I am, I had a plastic bag in the car. So I watched um, where the owl pellet fell um, and I picked it up with a plastic bag and I took it home and I let it dry. Um, and, then I and then I dissected it on that same page a few days later um, and drew all the bones that I found in it, um, which was really fun. Um, and also a little comic of how I found the owl and watching it cough up a pellet and all that, that was really, really fun. Um, but yeah, this is, I've seen many, many great horned owls, but I had never seen it do this behavior, which was really, really cool. Oh, that's neat. Um, again, and then you've got a whole series of questions on, from the pellet, a series of questions um, um, from the owl itself. I also like that little um, behavior storyboard of you and your mom's interactions there. Um, putting these sorts of personal things in um, helps us be able to, 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 to remember not just the biologically what's, what's happening there, but important social interactions and what kind of gives meaning to our life. That then helps you remember this really lovely moment with mom. A to just a quick time check. There is about half an hour left, and I know you want to have time for your live demos later. Ah. Mm. So what we're going to have to do is uh, make a rift in the time-space continuum. Um, the uh, um, yes, <clears throat> All right. So let's let's see if we can. I'm so I'm just going to show you kind of a few other examples of um, of behavioral sort of recording behaviors. If you look here, there's a number of storyboards here. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and if you look over here, here's a map showing one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is a red-shouldered hawk having a bad day because of neighborhood crows um, being mobbed through my neighborhood. And um, at each point, sort of what I see happening. And so you see, this is storytelling here in the little map. And also you have storytelling as you're going through these different um, frames. Thinking of creating your own little nature comics 
is a great way to be able to record behaviors. Um, so here is interactions with um, human skulls and a brown pelican. And um, when the brown pelican comes up um, after a dive, how the, the, the gulls just dogpile on it to try to get um, all of those fish. And then the, the, the pelican did this interesting thing, which is as it flew off, trying to get away from this group, it was flying around with its head in this vertical position. I've never seen that before. I wonder if that was related to these sorts of birds. So just sort of remember, you kind of make yourself like a little comic storyboard and you can get a lot of these behaviors. Here's another example of the same thing. Um, this is looking at, here's a stilt baby, aww, all right? Um, and notice that I just got so into its cute little head that I made its body too small. So notice that there's just a line out here saying this is actually how big the body should be, right? That's okay. I made the body the wrong size, but here's just the actual information. Look, the body profile should be all the way out here. Um, but here's this big five foot long gopher snake coming up. Um, and here's the little chick over here. Oh no, what's gonna happen? All right, but um, dad gets out right in front of this gopher snake and is like, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, and calling and wings spread and dancing in front of it. And the gopher snake goes like, oh, I'm out of here. And then the family walks off together, the three of them. Oh, wow, that's really cool. There's only one chick. I wonder if they had had bad experience with this character and the others. But you see how that little set of storyboards helps you record that event and information. Similar thing going on here. Here is a peregrine falcon coming in, bam! And, um, and then uh, hurts one of these sandpipers, then flies around and picks up the sandpiper and goes off with it. So you can record not just an individual bird, but the behaviors that you see. Another thing that is beautiful to do is to try to get a connect, more of a connection with a place. And um, you see some examples of ways of doing that on this page right here. Yeah, so this is really fun. This is something I've been doing recently. This is uh, more of a recent page of drawing an overhead map of the place and then arrows of where the different birds are and then drawing those birds that are there. So there was a pipit on the beach, there was a harrier, um, there were some owls in the cypress trees, um, which just a side note, um, I'm a huge Shakespeare fan. And so I have a little quote from Othello, well met at Cyprus um, of the owls in the cypress trees, which I think is really funny. Um, anyway, <laughs> but, <laughs> that's just kind of fun. Um, so I also put little quotes and things um, in my journal a lot. Um, and make myself laugh because um, I'm good at doing that. Um, and so anyway, um, and then also a little landscape here at the bottom of just kind of the beach and the waves um, to kind of give a sense of where we are, um, which was really fun. Um, so yeah, that was that was a really fun page. So this, yeah, just everything's in context here. So I can be, um, you know, out at the beach, here's the, 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 the flowers that I'm finding. This little locator map puts all these little beasties, they've got a place to go. And then here's the view down there. So you're looking at this place in lots of different ways. So not just getting tunnel vision on here's the bird, but here's the place. This is kind of thinking like an ecologist. And, um, Mad props on that. Here's um, using one of those strategies. Here's a little locator map showing where these different birds are hanging out around the edges of, of a little pond. Um, so you can make, you, you're putting your observations in context. I like what you're doing with those big arrows kind of coming in. I think I'm gonna uh, steal that approach. Here, um, study of some snowy plovers. And notice how having just the landscapes around puts these snowy plovers into context. You get a sense, oh, we're out on the beach. This is what we're looking at. This is what we're seeing. Here's a little map um, showing that uh, uh, there's a little, there are people, the parking area here, 
people come down to this side of the beach, you have to actually cross over the creek, take your shoes off and wade across the creek to get to where all the snowy plovers were. Um, and that's, that's their little spot over there. Um, so locator maps and context helps us be able to get, uh, have more fun with, um, with finding those places. So this next little piece um, kind of takes us back to that curiosity and investigation. Um, and the idea here is that when you find yourself a little mystery, um, lean into the things that you don't know and you don't understand and interesting things will happen. Um, so this is um, at the Lee Vining Community Center. If anybody has a chance to, when they get back to live events, go to the Mono, Bake, Mono Lake Birding Chautauqua, wonderful event. These are striped cliff swallow nests around the eaves of the building. So here's a map showing the locations of those. And then I'm looking at, so these are made out of different types of mud, different sources of the mud. So I was there with Fiona and we were both sketching these. And what we ended up doing is running around trying to find the source material for all these different types of mud. And um, so the, the tan was just sort of the general parent material on the ground around there. And the red was stuff that had been brought in for a baseball diamond. And what was the, what was the dark brown? Um, the dark brown was the edges of a sewage treatment plant that was over a barbed wire fence and through lots of grass with stickers that got in our socks. <laughs> yes. So we then, we needed to make sure. So we hopped that fence and went into the, the, the sewage treatment settling ponds to check out, you know, is this the source of this? Yes, and it was. <laughs> that was so cool. Um, and then um, I was looking at sort of the spacing between these. So sort of like, so for some reason they're switching from um, the sewage treatment to the parent material back to sewage treatment then back to the regular parent material. So it made me think that this stripe pattern, that this one here had been started to, that this might have actually been made at the same time. And if, so there's a possibility here, because then there's a big blank space and then you get to the red that at certain times, these different kinds of mud became available to the birds. And if that was the case, then they would have started making this nest and then this B and A would be the next ones made. So I was wondering if this, the, you know, actually kind of when different types of mud are available, if that kind of gives you a clock, this is my guess of when kind of the order in which these were made. So what, you're do what, we've, got, what we've got here is just a little mystery and hardcore geeking out on it that then leads you into jumping across barbed wire fences and going and playing in sewage treatment ponds. Um, this is looking at swans and um, wondering when it's stormy or sunny. I was wondering, when do they hunker down? When do they sit on the water versus the ice? When do they feed? And because I came up with this question, it then prompted me to go and start to collect data on that. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to collect a lot of data in the sun. More should happen. But you see, here's a question that can then prompt you to go and do a little investigation on your own. You don't have to learn things by reading it in a book or being told by somebody. You can run around in nature and figure stuff out. Yeah. There's a discovery that you made on this page too. Yes, um, so I've drawn many, many great horned owls um, over the time that I've journaled and the ears never felt in the right place. They never, they were always too far back or too far forward or too far to the side. They never quite worked. And only very, very recently did I realize that the ears are along the same line that the eyebrows are. And so that lower one with the orange on the face, 
um, I finally figured it out that they don't go like this. They go like this. They go straight up and they're in line with the eyebrows. And I hadn't realized that before. Um, so even on this same page, like that, 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 that one on the left kind of has the ears hooked down, which wasn't quite right. The other one was too far back. And now these ones, they're closer to the front and they're in that line of the eyebrow. So that was really cool. Um, and something I just recently discovered about great horned owls that I had never noticed before. And so what you're, you're doing is on something that you, or you know fairly well, you're constantly, because you have this challenge of also visually representing it, it's making you look again and again and again and again, and you're step by step by step by step updating the sort of iterations of your understanding of the structure of a critter. <clears throat> Love it. Here is, um, so uh, I, I've got questions about this little kestrel. Um, it's sort of sitting around um, in the wind, in a powerful windstorm. And um, this is its posture when the wind blows. This is its posture when the wind isn't there. And, but I was able to pull up my car right next to this thing and the bird didn't fly away. And so these are possible um, reasons why this bird didn't fly away. Maybe it was too difficult to fly in this wind, but then I saw this bird then take off the branch and go flying around perfectly fine in this kind of wind. And what that says to me is that this possible explanation of why that was is not what is going on there. This bird actually could um, fly perfectly well in the wind. I wonder why it let me get so close to it. Maybe um, now this, this one here also doesn't fly with prey. It was carrying the play, prey when it flew. So both of those explanations are now off my list. You can also, you see what I'm doing is I've got a little mystery here. I'm coming up with possible explanations and then using my observations to cross some of those off. 15 minute warning, Jack. Great. This was a really fun day of, um, this was in April um, and I was running around and there were warblers near my house. So I was drawing all, all the warblers and I decided I had seen so many species that day. I was gonna make a bird list on the side of all the different four letter codes of all the different species. And I was gonna color code them um, with green meaning usual suspects um, pink meaning spring migrants and blue meaning what are you doing here? Um, like I had no idea why this bird was here um, and I was not expecting it at all. Um, so I kind of color coded all the different birds that I saw from that day. Um, and so that was really fun. Um, and yeah, so I drew some warblers. There were some California gulls that were flying in a huge flock. Um, way up high in the sky and I'm nowhere near the ocean. So that was definitely a, what are you doing here? Um, and yeah, this was a really, really fun day. That's fun. So also what you can see here is a little bit of metacognition. So metacognition is thinking about the way that we're thinking. So you've got a list, but because she's got the list written down in front of her, she's able then to think about it more. She's color coded it um, for um, the usual suspects, the spring visitors, and I love that last category. What are you doing here? Um, just a, another way of getting your brain to, she, so she's able to visualize the data, visualize the information that she has here. That's cool. The last little piece I wanted to, us to kind of play with a little bit is adding, letting a place in your journal for kind of your sense of humor, um, any personal associations, feelings that you have or, or notes to yourself. Um, so I was looking through my journals and I found that on this journal page from the Sierra Nevada Field Campus in 2016, this was um, the, uh, there's a note on the bottom of the page, early morning birding with, and that's you on our 13th birthday, right? So, um, you know, this was, you know, I had met this, 
this young, enthusiastic birder, um, proto journaler. And for me, that was significant. I like, like, wow, really connected with, um, with, with this, with this youth. And I put that into my journal, not because it's a bird thing that I'm interested in, because it's something that personally connects with me. And may, is one of the things that made that bird, that, that birding morning special. Um, and who was to know that that friendship that started on your 13th birthday would grow into um, the, uh, the, 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 the friendship and professional relationship that, that we have. And it is, it's really fun to see that. So um, here's just sort of another example. This is a page from, um, of, of observations about black-shouldered kites and owls and um, walking around through this cypress grove my daughter climbed up this tree, went out on a branch, and there she is. That's that's Carolyn, um, and she uh, she's being an owl. She found an owl pellet up on this branch, and she said, "Daddy, I'm an owl." And so here she is. She's being an owl on this branch. Is it a bird thing? Well, sort of. But I'd say most importantly, it's something that personally connects me with this day, with this place, with this experience, and letting those things that have that kind of salience into my journals um, is also important. Um, one last example of this, um, this is a journal page from a new nature journaling friend that I've made through the Nature Journal Club. This is um, Volters and Volters keeps a toned paper journal. And you can see here's the original notes. They're translated into English over on the right. This is out on a really cold day. And what you're seeing here is Volters is observing birds <clears throat> and also thinking about birds. So <clears throat> there's a lot of thinking here about kind of heat transfer in these birds. So this bird is standing on the snow and it's got both feet down and um, wondering about sort of cold transfer from the bird to the environment around that and different ways that that can happen. So thinking about all those sorts of things, but I want to point out one other thing that Walters uh, uh, is seeing a bunch of, of um, of uh, crested tits around and other birds. And over here, a little note that says, um, I have to build bird nesting boxes for these tits, right? So being out here on this cold day, connecting with the birds, thinking about the cold, seeing the tits, then motivates Volters to take it the, the next step to think about sort of your connection and responsibility and being sort of a steward for these things. Um, and I think that that perhaps is one of the things that happens when we pay this closer kind of attention that we we fall more deeply in love with the world and we develop a sense of responsibility and stewardship for it. And I believe that the kind of attention that we spend, that we take when we're doing this form of journaling connects us more deeply with nature, that attention it itself is love. My working definition of love is sustained compassionate attention, the act of attention. And that's what is here, that attention is what is, and, and, and relationship, connection, that's what's motivating vaulters to go then and create bird nesting boxes. Um, vaulters, um, in, in, uh, in the garage, there's, a big, there's a, a big construction area filled with boxes in progress. And I think it's, monitoring, going to be ending up monitoring more than 30 homemade nesting boxes. 
That's really cool. But we don't behave that way unless we care. And we don't care unless we learn to pay attention. And, um, and that, um, I think is the, that I think is ultimately one of the greatest reasons to start this kind of work. That through our attention, we will connect more deeply with the world. And that perhaps that connection can change our behavior and make us better stewards of the planet. So um, uh, I want to check in with um, Haymar. Yes. Um, no. How many minutes do we have? There are seven minutes left until 11.30, six minutes now. Um, Fiona, should we do a, a little draw along? Sure. <laughs> okay. So um, actually, um, why, why don't we do this? Um, uh, I have found online um, a, a video of, um, of a lease turn. And the lease turn is just, it's, it's sitting there being a lease turn. And you'll see the lease turn from the front. And then the, um, another one comes in from the side. And you'll see the lease turn from the side. And what I'm going to ask everybody who's watching this to do is just to make some notes. Make some notes about this bird. And um, we are... <clears throat> um, second. I need to get back to the video. There it is. Um, and of, of whatever type feels appropriate to you. Again, there's no one right way to do this. Um, but let's see what you get. And Fiona's page is going to be different than mine. And uh, mine will be different than yours. And I am going to, so um, I found this on YouTube. Um, there's a person who has a collection of wonderful, wonderful bird videos. Um, uh, Tavalero. So there's the, the name of it. If you want to uh, look for these and follow this person um, and their, their collection of bird videos on, on YouTube. Um, that's the, 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 in the name in the bottom right-hand corner is the one to search by. Um, but let's, um, I, I'm thinking, oh, actually, here's what I need to do. Um, I need to first stop my share. I need to change my cam. And for the audience, the easiest way for you to view this will be to use gallery mode and Jack is going to have a screen share up, but what you can do is you can use the um, the bar that's going to be going right down the side of the screen to drag that um, video of the screen share smaller so that the images coming from the document cam um, of the live sketches come up a little bigger. Um, and well, this was working earlier, but now it's not. So um, I am not going to be able to share my screen. I'm having a connection difficulty, but we will be able to see um, Fiona's. That's too bad. It was working at the start. So, but, but I will be um, sketching along with this also. And you'll see that um, what I get is gonna be different than what you get. And um, Fiona's not gonna be able to see what I'm doing. She's gonna have something different. This is not an art contest. What you wanna do is observe something and document it. In, and, and document whatever kind of resonates with you, whether it's interactions, whether it's behaviors, whether it's appearance, it's okay, All right? And let's check this out. 
here's my bird. And go. You can also use words to describe what you see. And we'll be going a few minutes over the um, scheduled time as we usually do. But um, for everyone who has um, only allotted the hour and a half that was originally scheduled, thank you so much for being here. Please consider um, leaving a donation for Jack on his website and um, donating to Richardson Bay Audubon as well. Oh, that was it. Um, now, I want to sort of point out to everybody that you can't get everything, right? That's okay. That's okay. Um, what you um, what you do get is going to be for each of us is going to be different. We were kind of drawn to different sorts of things. Um, the, uh, so uh, Fiona, what was jumping out? For, oh, you're starting a question chain down there. <laughs> I only got one in, um, but yeah, I was, I was interested here. I'll turn my camera back on. Um, I was interested about the little display that they were doing um, where one kind of walked up to the other one and like put its beak up and the other one put its beak down. Um, and they mm -hmm. kind of did this little display. Um, I don't know if it was like a dominance display or like a, like a courtship display or like what they were doing. Um, but that, that was just kind of an interesting little behavioral thing that, that one kind of like made, like made its neck really long and like put its beak up in the air and the other one like crouched down, um, and yeah, they're they're so adorable. I love these little guys. Yeah, wasn't that? Aren't they sweet? They're so cute. So yeah, I, I find like when I watch something like this, if I just watch it, um, I kind of like, oh, that's cool. But if I'm really observing carefully and 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 sketching and journaling, I just fall in love with the little guys. Um, I'll, I'll show you what what I was up to with with mine. Oh, nice. 
Um, so for, 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 for me, um, so I started off with kind of a sketch from the front and I never finished that. I did finish the sketch from behind where it's kind of got these little white patches sort of that, that stick out behind that little crown. But the part that I thought was, was really interesting was the, um, what was on the head, you could see its little eyelid. There was oh, a little, cool. in the bottom part of its, the, the, of that black stripe that goes through, there was a little white eyelid and that that would kind of rise up. Um, and uh, so when it had its eye closed, you could see this little white thing kind of coming up into it. That's so cool. cool. I was excited about the eyelid. Um, and I also drew a part, the kind of sort of open mouth showing that the tongue didn't go all the way out. There's sort of a little tongue. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to see how the tongue kind of the, the corner part of the mouth, how, what that shape was, because it had its mouth closed before I went to look at it. So right. my mouth doesn't really close. Um, so cool. But, you know, so those are, are some, the, some of the things that were just sort of standing out to me. And everybody is going, will have picked up different things. And I'm also going to um, write that it's squeaky. Yeah. <laughs> um, and cute. All right. So I just wrote in that it's squeaky and cute. Um, the, there's so many different ways to journal. And all of them will open up doors for attention and connection. Um, whatever you do, whatever approach you take, um, do what works for you. But I do really want to encourage people just to start to, 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 to try it, to be bold. Um, you've now been journaling for four years. Almost five. Almost five. Almost five. All right. And, and it has just, it's opened doors for you. And also the technical skills of being able to see something and draw what you see have also grown along with it. These aren't gifts. The ability to do this just comes with pencil miles and paying attention. And this is one of these things that you could choose to spend your time doing all sorts of things and you will develop those skills as well. But I think that if you do choose to do this, you will find that it makes the world a more beautiful place to live in. And it will make you want to be um, uh, more involved with a community of stewards to help protect it and preserve it for yourself, for future generations and for the organisms themselves and for their intrinsic right to be here and exist on this planet. Thank you too so much for that. And, you know, um, I just wanted to make a quick point because of a lot of the comments coming in um, being about gear and things like that. And I really hope that what you take away from this class is some of the concepts that Jack just said there. It's not about the gear. It's about engaging with nature in a different way. And I'm so impressed with both Fiona and Jack's amazing um, nature journaling abilities that, you know, I, I don't have anywhere near that kind of skill. Um, but what makes them so yes. impressive is not the gear that they have, you know, the, the you know, set of water, you know, we, we put this um, equipment out there because it is helpful to have um, good equipment. But at the end of the day, what makes the difference is not the equipment, it's you. And, you know, that's part of the reason why we make this class free and available to everyone and accessible, because ultimately that practice um, is not something that you really need gear for. It's um, something that we want everyone to be able to engage with. That, that's so true. Um, yeah, it, it, it's not about stuff. It's not about gear. Um, I was uh, talking with a, a wonderful bird photographer um, a person who's devoted their life to sort of mastering the art of capturing the essence of birds in photographs. And so what is the most frequent question that you are asked? And he said, people will ask you, what camera do you use? Right? 
Um, but th that question is actually one of the least important parts of that process because you could give that same photographer a different camera and there still would be, it's the sort of the, the, the trained um, eye and understanding of birds that kind of get you at the right place at the right time for the right picture. Um, so my kind of go-to tools right now, mostly it's, I do most of my stuff with a ballpoint pen. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's not the tools. Um, and, but if, if people want to learn more about technique sorts of things, there are lots of ways to do that. There's lots of inspirational teachers in the Nature Journal Club right now who are giving um, free or donation-based uh, workshops and classes. Um, if you want to learn more with me, um, every week I teach three um, free or donation-based um, workshops that on different aspects of, of, of nature journaling. And we can kind of get into kind of the nitty gritty of a bunch of the different techniques and we do there. But the most important thing is, is putting yourself in the presence of nature, having an open heart and an open mind, a mind and heart that are open to the wonder and the beauty and to kind of harness your curiosity and have that pull you into a deeper relationship with those things. And then give yourself the room and the patience to start a skill that you haven't, <clears throat> that you haven't been practicing and put in some pencil miles and the skill absolutely will come. It absolutely will come. And it doesn't take forever. It takes about a year of just doing it on a regular basis. And you're like, Oh, I really, I, I get these mechanics down. Um, so make this a year of playing with birds in a book, your book, and I think that you will find that um, the world of nature and the wonder of birds unfolds before you in a way that you have never known. And I'm also just so grateful to Fiona for being here with me, my sketching buddy. Uh, we've had many great adventures and more to come. And thank you for what you do to inspire me and others. Um, also, I want to send out my respect and appreciation of the National Audubon Society um, and my local chapter, my Richardson Bay Audubon, for the work that you do in conservation, stewardship, and education. Uh, programs like this are just uh, emblematic of the sorts of things that you're doing to connect people with um, birds and the world. And I'm so grateful for what you do. Um, want to encourage everybody who's listening um, find and support your local chapter of the Audubon Society. Check out what's going on at the Richardson Bay Audubon um, uh, chapter and um, if it's possible to support them as well, please. Um, you've, you'll find a community of really good people. Thank you. And Fiona, did you want to give anyone any place to keep up with some of the work that you're doing? Um, yes, I have a website um, that has some of my journal pages on it if you'd like to see more, um, fionasongbird.com. Um, so that's my website um, if you'd like to see more of my work. Um, but yes, just keep journaling. Um, I have seen myself get so much better. Just looking back at my journals, I was like, wow, I remember thinking this page was the best thing I ever did. And look at how far I've come. It's just so crazy to look back at that stuff and realize how far you've come. And trust me, the more you do it, the better you will get. And it is so much fun. I really encourage you to do it. It is so much fun. And, and we really wanna see the work too. So please use hashtag Nature Journal Audubon or post on the Nature Journal Club on Facebook. And you know, like a super quick note about social media because we're over time. I know like part of the gear stuff is you see other people's really pretty um, pages on social media and you want to kind of compare your work to theirs but um, I, th I think the most important thing about it is ex extracting the benefit from s learning from others without necessarily taking the negatives of judging yourself compared to others and you know eventually you will get there um, so unless there was any last words Jack um, thank you everyone so much for coming to this class
and you can, you can make this happen for yourself. Um, it's a process that works. Trust that process. Um, and um, put in those pencil miles and, and, and it, will, it will happen for you too. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you um, again, um, so much uh, respect and gratitude to the Audubon Society for what you do for conservation and stewardship of um, birds and the habitats that they live in um, around the world. Bye everyone.